Hello everyone. Today we are going to study the base of the brain. The base of the brain also can be considered to be the inferior surface of the brain or the ventral surface of the brain, whichever way you look at it. However, here we have the first picture that we are going to look at of the base of the brain. And you can see the base of the brain here. You can see the frontal pole here. You can see the temporal pole here and you can see the occipital pole here. And you can make out that the posterior part of this base of the brain uh, is covered by the brain stem. You have the midbrain here, you have the pons here, you have the medulla oblongata here and you have the inferior surface of the cerebellar hemispheres over here. So this in this posterior part of the uh, inferior surface of the brain or the base of the brain because it is covered by the brain stem and the cerebellum you cannot see the cortical structures that you cannot see the sulci and gyri that are here on the lower surface of the cerebral cortex. In a subsequent picture when we will remove this then you will be able to see the whole of the cerebral cortex on the base of the brain. Now if you look at the frontal pole you already have understood that the frontal pole is in contact with the squamous part of the frontal bone and this anterior part of the base of the brain is also called the orbital surface. It rests more or less on the orbital plate of the frontal bone and on the central part of the body of the sphenoid. So body of the sphenoid somewhere here and orbital plate of the frontal bone somewhere here. Further back this temporal pole of the brain you already know is in contact with the greater wing of the sphenoid separated by meninges of course. So you have the uh, temporal pole over here and the greater wing of the sphenoid and you know the occipital pole behind is in contact with the inner surface of the squamous part of the occipital bone again separated by meninges and venous sinuses. So frontal pole, temporal pole, occipital pole, all these of the brain as we have said is called the orbital surface and this surface the between the brain and the here you have the crescentic tentorium cerebelli. So because you are here, so this is called the tentorial surface of the brain and it rests upon the tentorium cerebelli. If you look at the two halves of the brain here, you find that they are not totally symmetrical. It appears that on this side, this temporal pole has been pulled outwards to view a little bit more of the structures in this region. So that is why here the temporal pole is slightly inward. Here the temporal pole has been slightly pulled outward. Not only that, because the temporal pole over here is inward, you can see a little bit of the superolateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere. So you can see the superior and inferior temporal sulcus over here and the corresponding gyri over here. But here it has been pulled so you can only see inferior surface of the temporal lobe. And if you go by the whole brain, this midline gap over here is the median longitudinal fissure and this border that you have here is the inferior of the cerebral hemisphere and this border from the frontal to the lateral border of the cerebral hemisphere. So inferomedial border, inferolateral border, frontal pole, temporal pole, occipital pole, orbital surface, tentorial surface. Now if we go into the details on the orbital surface you can see that there is a sulcus over here close to the midline. This is called the olfactory sulcus, one here and you can see that the olfactory sulcus is covered by this structure. This is the olfactory bulb and what is the olfactory bulb? It is actually a collection of neurons into which the olfactory cells that the central processes of the olfactory cells they come and synapse and you know the olfactory cells are in the olfactory epithelium in the roof of the nose and the filaments of the olfactory nerve about 15 or 20 they pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid and they rise up and they synapse in the olfactory bulb. So beyond the olfactory bulb you have this olfactory tract. So olfactory bulb, olfactory tract passing backward and you can see the olfactory tract is diverging. It is diverging into the medial and lateral olfactory stria. There is a very small intermediate stria also but you can't see it. So you have the olfactory bulb diverging into medial and lateral olfactory stria and between them over here this space is called the olfactory trigone. So olfactory bulb, olfactory tract, medial and lateral olfactory stria and olfactory trigone and this gyrus medial to the olfactory sulcus is a reasonably straight gyrus and that is why it is called gyrus rectus. And as we have said that this part of the frontal lobe of the brain is 
lying over the orbital plate of the frontal bone. So this part of the cerebral hemisphere is lying over the upper surface of the body of the sphenoid. You recall in the upper surface of the body of the sphenoid, you had studied from anterior to posterior, jugum sphenoidal, sulcus chiasmatis, tuberculum cellae, and then the anterior clinoid process and the cella tersica and the dorsum cellae. So you know that over the jugum sphenoidally, you had the olfactory bulb and the gyrus rectus. So this is that same olfactory bulb and the gyrus rectus. Again, if you come between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, you can make out this large gap over here. This is the lattice which you will have seen over the superolateral surfaces when you studied the sulci and gyri on the superolateral surface. So this is that same lateral sulcus. So you can see the lateral sulcus has not started on the superolateral surface. It has started on the inferior surface. So this here is the stem of the lateral sulcus between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. This is the stem of the olfactory sulcus. This is quite deep and this lodges the middle cerebral artery and the deep middle cerebral vein and on a much more superficial plane on the outer surface you have the superficial middle cerebral vein. So this is that stem of the lateral sulcus over here and you can see the lateral sulcus has begun from this depression over here. This depression here is the anterior perforated substance. So this anterior perforated substance is the depression from which the stem of the lateral sulcus takes its origin and what lies on different parts of the anterior perforated substance medially you have olfactory tract and the olfactory stria laterally you have this hook like part of the temporal lobe that is called the uncus so laterally you have the uncus of the temporal lobe and medially you have the olfactory bulb the olfactory tract and the olfactory trigone now this anterior perforated substance what is its perforations for it is for the central branches of the middle cerebral artery not only that in this depression uh, between the frontal and the temporal lobes at the base of the brain. This is the point where you have the termination of the internal carotid artery. You know that this is the same internal carotid artery which has branched out of the common carotid artery at the level of the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. And from the upper border of the thyroid cartilage it has passed in the carotid sheath along with the internal jugular vein and vagus nerve right up to the base of the skull from where it had entered the lower opening of the carotid canal in the best part of the temporal bone in front of the middle ear cavity taken a 90 degree bend and moved anteromedially come out of the apex of the petrous part of the temporal bone through the anterior opening of the carotid canal then it has gone into the medial wall of the cavernous sinus lying on the greater wing of the sphenoid and guarded by the lingula taking along with it the abducent nerve and then when it has left the cavernous process, it has pierced the roof of the cavernous, cavernous sinus and it has uh, taken another hook, another turn medial to the anterior clinoid process. And you know between the anterior and medial middle clinoid process, you had the carotico-clinoid ligament and foramen. And after coming up through the medial side of the anterior clinoid process, it has gone up to the base of the brain and it has again taken angular bend this entire bending root of the internal carotid artery is called the carotid siphon. This bend is important to damp the pressure within the internal carotid artery and reduce the high pressure that is coming up from the arch of the aorta so that the brain gets blood supply at a uniform pressure. And then this internal carotid artery reaches this point over here over the anterior perforated substance where it terminates as the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery and the posterior communicating artery. So the terminal branches of the internal carotid artery are anterior cerebral, middle cerebral and posterior communicating. We will look at these arteries in a little while but this anterior perforated substance is meant for the deeper branches of the middle cerebral artery. When the middle cerebral artery arises from the internal carotid artery, it passes up through this lateral sulcus, through the stem of the lateral sulcus and goes into the superolateral surface. So you see we have come a long way in our discussion and learned, recapitulated and reduced a lot of things. Now let us move further to the center and see what else we can see. Again you can make out that because this is the intern part of the temporal pole, you can also see some of the sulci and gyri on the superolateral surface which you can view from below also. Now if you look at the central part over here, central part of the base of the brain, we have to look at the central part of the base of the brain.
and this under surface under surface of the temporal lobe so we have to look at some sulci gyri over here and the structures in the central part but the problem is that the sulci and gyri over here are partly overlapped and obscured by the brain stem and the cerebellum so it will be better for us that when we remove this brain stem and cerebellum then we take a clearer look at the sulci and gyri underneath over here here we will just see as much of it as can be seen with the whole thing actually when you remove the whole brain the brain in situ is going to look like this only when you cannot remove the brain from the skull cleanly then what happens is sometimes the brain stem and cerebellum tear off and the insania condition you have brought out the cerebral hemispheres and you have brought out the fore brain but the mid brain onwards the brain stem has remained within the skull and the cerebellum has remained within the skull and then again you have to do a second dissection cut out the tentorium cerebelli properly and remove this part of the brain and stick it up with a match stick or something into the rest of the brain so that you get the intact picture of the brain this happens sometimes so it's, uh, often uh, we cannot get a clear cut first uh, extraction of the whole brain and we cannot get a perfect picture like this that usually happens not only that this inferior surface of the brain is also covered by the pia matter and the arachnoid matter so you often have a coating of pia arachnoid and uh, some of the blood vessels over here which come out along with the brain most of the time when you remove the brain you are going to get a lot of blood cells in that is useful that is useful because you can study the blood vessels over here particularly the circle of willis if it comes out with the brain it is very good if it does not come out with the brain then it is remaining inside the cranium then you have to use a torch and study it in the cranium and if it comes out with the brain it is even better you can study the branches of the circle of willis as they fan out over the rest of the brain anyway let us not waste any more time now this central part over here you can make out you have, we have already discussed the olfactory tract and the lateral and medial uh, olfactory stria and the olfactory trigone over here and the anterior perforated substance now medial to this olfactory trigone here you have the optic chiasma optic chiasma chiasma means crossing so you have a crossing over here now this is one optic nerve this is another optic nerve this s x shaped crossing over here is the optic chiasma and from the chiasma these structures leading back these are the optic tracts so optic nerve chiasma optic tract these are the structures very important structures that you have to study here now in the chiasma you have crossing so which fibers are crossing the fibers from the nasal half of the retina they are crossing in the optic chiasma and the fibers from the temporal half of the retina they are mostly passing uncrossed so this is the significance of the optic chiasma and so optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract and behind that over here you have this big swelling this big swelling is actually the tuber sinarium actually this is the under surface of the hypothalamus therefore if you push a probe up through this region you are going to go in through the hypothalamus just above this region is the hypothalamus so this swelling over here is called the tuber sinarium this is a swelling from the under surface of the hypothalamus and from that tuber sinarium you can see this funnel shaped extension as a stalk so this funnel shaped part of the tuber sinarium that is extending still downwards is called the infundibulum and from this infundibulum you have the pituitary stalk so the pituitary therefore is hanging from the hypothalamus that part is now clear to you so the pituitary stalk is hanging from the lower part of the hypothalamus and that broader elevation in the lower part of the hypothalamus is called the tuber sinarium so you have tuber sinarium infundibulum a small trumpet shaped conical structure and the pituitary stalk so when you remove the brain the pituitary seldom comes out with the brain because the pituitary gland is trapped inside the cella tarsica by the diaphragma cellae so when you are removing the brain naturally the pituitary stalk will be torn off and you will be having a small remnant of the infundibulum so behind the optic chiasma you have the tuber sinarium a swelling from the hypothalamus and the infundibulum and pituitary stalk still behind that you have these two small like structures rounded these are called the mammillary bodies mammilla means a nipple so this small nipple like rounded structures these are called mammillary bodies now these mammillary bodies are also nuclear groups which are part of the hypothalamus mammillary bodies are part of both the hypothalamus as well as the limbic system so 
you are still into the hypothalamus tuber cinerium part of the hypothalamus mammillary body is part of the hypothalamus and behind that you have another perforated area depressed perforated area this is called the posterior perforated substance so you had anterior perforated substance over here on two on two sides but posterior perforated substance is midline and single so two anterior perforated substances and only one posterior perforated substance now this posterior perforated substance what is it perforated by it is perforated by the central branches of the posterior cerebral artery so where are you going to get the posterior cerebral artery over here now the exact posterior cerebral arteries we will see in a later diagram but the posterior cerebral arteries are here and their central branches are going through here so central branches of the middle cerebral artery here central branches of the posterior cerebral artery here so now you can make out that this entire region is a diamond shaped structure and on the two sides of this posterior perforated substance you can make out this v this v shaped structure is actually part of the midbrain it is called cras cerebri or basis pedunculi so this is the cras cerebri or the crura or the legs of the cerebral hemispheres why they are compared to the legs or crura of the cerebral hemispheres because the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers that descend from the cerebral cortex and the other structures below the cortex to the brain stem they are all passing through the cras cerebri of the midbrain so cras cras important conduit of vertical fibers passing from the cerebral hemispheres to the brain stem and this cras cerebri are part of the midbrain so here you actually have the midbrain the cras cerebri are parts of the midbrain now you can make out this entire diamond shaped structure over here anteriorly you have the optic chiasma on the two sides you have the optic tracts posteriorly posteriorly posterolaterally you have these cras cerebri and in the center you have the superior border of the pons this is the pons so the superior border of the pons is over here so optic chiasma optic tract cras cerebris cras cerebris pleural would be crura cerebri and over here superior border of the pons this diamond shaped structure is called the interpeduncular fossa why because this cras cerebri are also called basis pedunculi or cerebruncles so because these two cerebral peduncles have a depression between them this diamond shaped area is called interpeduncular fossa and these structures that is tuber cinerium infundibulum pituitary stalk a pair of mammillary bodies and posterior perforated substance these are the contents of the interpeduncular fossa not only that slightly below the interpeduncular fossa in the subarachnoid space you have within the subarachnoid space the circle of willis that is a major arterial anastomosis supplying the inferior surface and also a major part of the superior lateral surface of the cerebral hemispheres we will look at this vascular ring the circle of willis in a subsequent diagram but let us go to the other important features first now because we have studied something of the central part now we will go over to this lateral part now this is the under surface of the temporal lobe this is the temporal lobe so we have one bulging point here this bulging point we have said is the temporal pole of the brain but you have another bulging point here this bulging point we have said is the ancus of the temporal lobe ancus means a hook so because this hook like bulging point is there this is called the ancus so you have two prominent parts of the temporal lobe we have the temporal pole over here and you have the ancus over here and of the sulci and gyri over here two are most important that is the occipital temporal sulcus and the collateral sulcus now this is not the whole of the collateral sulcus this is the anterior part of the collateral sulcus which is called the rhinal sulcus and this rhinal sulcus actually isolates this ancus so this is the occipital temporal sulcus that you have here and you have lateral and medial occipital temporal gyri you have the lateral occipital temporal gyrus you have the medial occipital temporal gyrus and because you have the collateral sulcus in here medial to the collateral sulcus anteriorly you cannot see the collateral sulcus over here it is much more posterior but we can see its anterior extension the rhinal sulcus and just as you have the ancus over here medial to the collateral sulcus you have the para hippocampal gyrus which we will see in a later picture when we have removed this part however we cannot help it since this part is there 
we have to discuss this also now we have said that these cross cerebri they were parts of the so again these cross cerebri are parts of the midbrain this is the pons so this is the ventral surface or anterior surface of the pons this is also called the basilar part of the pons and you can see transverse striations in the pons over here these transverse striations are actually the pontocerebellar fibers going transversely and this lateral part of the pons is the middle cerebellar peduncle so actually these fibers are going from the pons to the cerebellum and in the middle you have the sulcus this is called the basilar sulcus because this is going to lodge the basilar artery now again we come back to this cross cerebri cross cerebri here and here now from medial to the cross cerebri from over here you have the emergence of the oculomotor nerve so medial to the cross cerebri you have the emergence of the oculomotor nerve and somewhere here from lateral to the cross cerebri you can see the emerging trochlear nerve so oculomotor nerve medial to the cross cerebri lateral to the cross cerebri is the trochlear nerve so the trochlear nerves are actually coming from the posterior surface or the dorsal surface of the brain stem so the trochlear nerve is the only cranial nerve which comes from the dorsal surface of the brain all the other cranial nerves are on the ventral surface of the brain so medial to the cross cerebri oculomotor nerve lateral to the cross cerebri trochlear nerve so now you have the olfactory nerve here the olfactory bulb tract and stria you have the optic nerve here you had the oculomotor nerve medial to the brain cross cerebri trochlear nerve lateral to the cross cerebri and now you have come to the pons the basilar sulcus the transverse striations the upper border of the pons the lower border and the on the side these constitute the middle cerebellar peduncle and they are leading on to the cerebellum and you can see between the basilar part of the pons and the middle cerebellar peduncle you have this very powerful and very fat nerve that is coming out of the pons this nerve is the trigeminal nerve and you can make out that there is a slender bundle medially and a much thicker bundle laterally you know that the major part of the trigeminal nerve is sensory in nature only a small minor part is motor which moves with the mandibular nerve so you see this minor motor part is the motor root of the trigeminal nerve and this fat one is the sensory root of the trigeminal nerve so the trigeminal nerve exits the brain from the ventral surface of the pons between the basilar part of the pons and the middle cerebellar peduncle so again olfactory optic oculomotor trochlear trigeminal with its motor and sensory root now you come to the lower border of the pons beyond the lower border of the pons you can make out the medulla oblongata and in the medulla oblongata you can make out that the proximal part or the upper part is swollen and the lower part is slim so that is why this is called the bulb because it is swollen so this is the bulb or the medulla oblongata of the brain stem and here you have the anterior median sulcus and then you have this swelling these are the swellings of the pyramid and beyond the pyramid you have the antero lateral sulcus over here and beyond the antero lateral sulcus you have this second swelling this is the olive and behind the olive you have what we call the postero lateral sulcus and beyond the postero lateral sulcus you have the inferior cerebellar peduncles so pyramid olive inferior cerebellar peduncles antero medial sulcus antero lateral sulcus postero lateral sulcus now if you look at the anterior antero median sulcus you can make out that proximally where it abuts on the lower border of the pons there is a depression this depression is called the foramen cecum so foramen cecum you have one foramen cecum in the tongue you have a second foramen cecum over here so foramen cecum antero median sulcus and you can see the sulcus is obliterated lower down in the medulla this is due to the crossing of the pyramidal fiber so you have the crossing of the pyramidal fibers which will obliterate the anterior median sulcus for the lower down and these are then the pyramids which are actually mainly constituted by the pyramidal fibers which are the corticospinal fibers and blended with that you have some corticonuclear fibers now between the pons the pyramid you have the emergence of the abducens nerve 
so the abducens nerve exits the brain stem between the pons and the pyramid or lower border of the pons and the pyramid of the medulla then beyond the pyramid you have the anterolateral sulcus and through this anterolateral sulcus you have the emergence of the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve so these rootlets that are coming out through the anterolateral sulcus cut down over here and visible over here these are the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve so between the pyramid and the olive the next swelling you have the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve and between the olive and the inferior cerebellar peduncle in the posterolateral sulcus you have the rootlets of the 9th 10th and 11th cranial nerve that is glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory nerves so through this posterolateral sulcus you have glossopharyngeal vagus accessory nerve so although the vagus is the 12th cranial nerve it emerges further anteriorly and 9th 10th 11th cranial nerve they emerge further laterally so lower border of the pons again between the pons and the pyramid you have the abducens nerve again between the lower border of the pons and the olive you have the facial and vestibulo cochlear nerves now in the facial nerve you again have a sensory part and a motor part so the motor root again is the medial part and the sensory root is the lateral part and again in the vestibulo cochlear nerve over here you have the vestibular part and the cochlear part again vestibular part is medial and the cochlear part is lateral so between from the lower border of the pons you have the emergence of abducens nerve facial nerve and vestibulo cochlear nerve abducens nerve between pons and pyramid facial and vestibulo cochlear nerve between the pons and the olive and through the medulla through the anterolateral sulcus you have the emergence of the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve through the posterolateral sulcus you have the emergence of the glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory nerves so now you have learned a lot about the brain stem already and in fact you have completed a description of the ventral surface of the brain stem i would advise you to take this time and study the external appearance of the posterior or dorsal surface of the brain stem as well now apart from the brain stem you visualize the upper surface of the cerebellar here you know the vermis because that is covered by the brain stem but the lateral portions the cerebellar hemispheres you can make out and you can make out somewhere here the floculo nodular lobe the floculus of the floculo nodular lobe now the cerebellar hemisphere is divided into separate segments which have fancy names of which the last part is the floculo nodular lobe with the nodule in the middle and the floculus at the side so you have this floculus of the cerebellum here and the small tuft like fluffy structures that you can see this is the emergence of the choroid plexus through the lateral openings in the roof of the fourth ventricle now you have studied a lot of the under surface of the brain you have in fact studied most everything that there is to know about the base of the brain however for further clarity we will go through a few other pictures let us look at this picture in this picture we have removed the brain stem and the cerebellum so that the inferior surface of the temporal lobe is totally exposed so now here you have the remaining portions that you can see of the lobe so here you can make out the occipito temporal sulcus over here and the collateral sulcus over here so occipito temporal sulcus and collateral sulcus you can see a larger part of the base of the brain over here so you can see the occipito temporal sulcus and the collateral sulcus over here and you can make out a small cut off portion anteriorly over here that is the rhinal sulcus this small cut off portion over here is the rhinal sulcus actually it, this is the rhinal sulcus the anterior continuation of the collateral sulcus is the rhinal sulcus so we have removed the brain stem and we have spread out the lower surface of the brain and you cannot and we have uh, dispensed with this lateral of the temporal lobe and we have flattened out the inferior surface so two important sulci that you can observe first the occipito temporal sulcus and the collateral sulcus and the anterior end of the collateral sulcus that is the rhinal sulcus that you can make out over here
so these are the lateral and medial occipito temporal gyri and this is then the para hippocampal gyrus so this is the para hippocampal gyrus and because the sides of the uh, in the sides of this uh, specimen because they have been pulled apart by taking drawing this picture this picture is taken from netter's atlas so in the beginning even i was not sure what is what it appears to be slightly distorted however this is a very useful diagram and because the sides have been pulled apart you can see a lot of other structures which you could not have normally seen apart from this occipito temporal sulcus and collateral sulcus you can make out over here because of this pulled out portion you can see the genu of the corpus callosum and again posteriorly you can see the splenium of the corpus callosum and in this gap over here you can see the lateral geniculate body medial geniculate body and the pulvinar the posterior end of the thalamus so the pulvinar of the thalamus lateral and medial geniculate body and the genu of the corpus callosum splenium of the corpus callosum they are not normally visible in the base of the brain and you will not mention them as structures of the base of the brain also they are not to be seen from this surface they are to be seen from the medial surface however because of this stretching apart you can also see a part of the cingulate gyrus over here so all these structures are additional structures which have been displayed for your benefit these additional structures are when you are viewing the stretched brain these are not structures normally seen through the base of the brain again the familiar structures you have the olfactory sulcus the gyrus rectus the olfactory bulb tract olfactory stria anterior perforated substance optic chiasma the tuber cinereum and infundibulum mammillary bodies posterior perforated substance and you can make out a cross section of the midbrain you can see the cross cerebri over here somewhat like this and these cross cerebri you can make out now that these cross cerebri over here they are crossed by the optic tracts so these are cross cerebri they are crossed by the optic tracts and the optic tracts are actually going deep in the lateral geniculate body so the uh cross cerebri are crossed by the optic tracts they are crossed by the basal veins and they are crossed by the posterior cerebral arteries these are the three structures crossing over the cross cerebri anyway you can make out the enlarged part or the broader part of the cross cerebri you can see that this is the cross cerebri or the basis basis pedunculi or the cerebral peduncle and you can make out that between the cross cerebri and the rest of the midbrain you have this band of dark structures this is the substantia nigra so cross cerebri substantia nigra and behind you have the rest of the tegmentum of the midbrain and you can see these red nuclei over here and you can make out the aqueduct of sylvius passing through the midbrain it is connecting the lateral ventricles with the third uh, it is connecting the uh, ventricle with the uh, with the fourth ventricle and it is passing through the midbrain and here you can see the aqueduct of sylvius so this aqueduct of sylvius is actually going from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle so this here is a cross section of the midbrain with the cross cerebri the substantia nigra the red nucleus and the aqueduct of sylvius so you can see much more than was originally intended to see in the base of the brain so all other structures remain the same frontal pole temporal pole occipital pole and the other sulci and gyri visible from the under surface of the brain let us go to the next picture here you can see a very beautiful picture this is taken from the 41st edition of gray's anatomy and you can see that circle of willis that we had mentioned at the base of the brain we had said that just above the interpeduncular fossa you have an arterial anastomosis which is called the circle of willis and here you can see the end of the inter carotid artery we had said the internal carotid artery ends over the anterior perforated substance and it ends as anterior cerebral artery middle cerebral artery and posterior communicating artery these are the branches that you can see anterior cerebral middle cerebral posterior communicating they are the most important branches apart from that you also have an anterior choroidal artery you can see this one this is the anterior choroidal artery so this is the termination of the internal carotid artery and these are the anterior cerebral arteries the anterior cerebral arteries are connected by the anterior communicating artery and this posterior communicating artery joins the internal carotid artery trifurcation with the posterior cerebral artery so you have now 
completed the circle of Willis, rather if you can call it the polygon of Willis. And you can see this anterior cerebral artery is going on to the medial surface of the brain. The middle cerebral artery is going through the lateral sulcus into the superolateral surface of the brain and posterior communicating artery is completing the circle of Willis from behind by joining the posterior cerebral arteries. Again if you move back, this here is the basilar artery. We had said that the ventral surface of the pons has got a basilar sulcus to lodge the basilar artery. This is that same basilar artery. It is formed by the union of the two posterior cerebral arteries. So posterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery joining to form the basilar artery, basilar artery ending as the posterior cerebral arteries. So posterior cerebral artery and quite close to it you have the superior cerebellar artery. Now if you have a superior cerebellar artery it must be going to the upper surface of the cerebellum and you must be having an inferior cerebellar artery that is going to the lower surface of the cere cerebellum. So in inferior cerebellar artery you have two, you have anterior inferior cerebellar artery and you have posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So these arteries arising from the basilar artery they are actually anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. So anterior inferior cerebellar arteries arising from here and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries are branches of the vertebral artery. So the superior cerebellar artery going to the upper surface of the cerebellum and two to the inferior surface. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery from the basilar artery and the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries from the vertebral arteries and you can also make out that these two vertebral arteries they are giving the anterior spinal artery branch which is fusing to form a single anterior spinal artery which is passing through the anterior medial sulcus of the medulla oblongata. Not only that you can make out that here between the superior cerebral, uh, between the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar arteries you have the passage of the oculomotor and clear nerve. So between posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar arteries you have oculomotor and trochlear nerves and this basilar artery apart from these large branches that is the terminal posterior cerebral artery, the superior cerebellar artery and the anterior, uh, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, it gives the smaller pontine branches, not only that it also gives a labyrinthine branch. So this labyrinthine artery is going through the internal auditory meatus along with the facial and vestibular nerves and it is supplying the inner ear. So this basilar artery then gives the posterior inferior, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, labyrinthine artery, pontine arteries, superior cerebellar artery and terminal branch, the posterior cerebellar, posterior cerebral arteries. So a lot of branches from the basilar artery and this circle of Willis forms an anastomosis in the carotid territory over here and the vertebrobasilar territory over here. So this is part of the anterior cerebral circulation. This is part of the posterior cerebral circulation which unite at the circle of Willis. From this middle cerebral artery, the deep branches that are going to go through, they are going through the anterior perforated substance and from this posterior cerebral artery, the deep branches, they are going through the anterior perforated substance and from this posterior cerebral arteries, the deep branches, they are going through the posterior perforated substance. So you have seen a lot of structures in the base of the brain by now and you have seen some of the major blood vessels also. Let us see what else is there. Here we can see a blown out picture. You can see the internal, art, uh, the internal carotid artery termination over here and you can make out the middle cerebral artery going into the lateral sulcus and these are the branches of the middle cerebral artery that are going through the anterior perforated substance and you can make out that there are deep branches from this anterior cerebral and anterior communicating also. Some of them pierce independently through the substance of the brain but many of them they also come through the anterior perforated substance. Again posteriorly you can see just as you have anteromedial and anterolateral set of deep branches. Here you have posteromedial and posterolateral set of deep branches. The posteromedial set of deep branches they are going through the posterior, cerebra, posterior perforated substance. They are arising from the posterior cerebral arteries and these posterolateral groups some of them are piercing independently, some of them are still going through the posterior perforated substance. So here you can see a 
closer view of the circle of villages. You can see the termination of internal carotid, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral, posterior commutating artery, the post basilar artery, bifurcating into the posterior cerebral artery, and the two anterior cerebral arteries joined by so the, they are joined by the anterior communicating artery. So these are the anterior cerebral arteries joined by the anterior communicating artery. So branches of the medial, anterolateral, posteromedial, and posterolateral groups. Let us see if there is anything else to be seen. Now this in this last diagram you have a blow up of the central part of the base of the brain. And there the interpeduncular fossa is clearer than ever. You can see the optic chiasma over here and the optic tracts crossing over the crust cerebri. And here you can see the lateral geniculate body. This is the posterior end of the thalamus and this bulge over here is the lateral geniculate body. And you can clearly make out that the optic tracts have led to the lateral geniculate body. And from the lateral geniculate body, you have the geniculocalcarine fibers which are going to the visual area on the occipital lobe. So here you can see a clearer view of the interpeduncular fossa bounded in front by the optic chiasma, on two sides by the optic tracts, posteriorly by the crust cerebri and the midline by the upper border of the pons. And here, on the, here you can see a little bit of the olfactory tract. You can see the medial and lateral olfactory stria. There is the olfactory trigone. And you can see the anterior perforated substance over here. And in this anterior perforated substance, again, you have the branches of the middle cerebral artery, some branches of the anterior cerebral artery and anterior communicating artery. Again, in this crust cerebri, medial to this crust cerebrus, you can see the emergence of the oculomotor nerve lateral to the crust cerebri coming from the posterior surface of the brain you can see the trochlear nerve and within the diamond shaped confines of the interpeduncular fossa you can see the tuber cinereum that is the swelling underneath the hypothalamus so there this trumpet shaped conical structure which is known as the infundibulum and which is continuous with the pituitary stalk behind you can see two nipple like rounded structures these are the mammillary bodies these are also part of the hypothalamic nuclei and again behind you can see the posterior perforated substance through which you had the central branches of the posterior cerebral artery going deep and again when you come to this pons we have said that in the middle of the pons you have the basilar sulcus lodging the basilar artery this is the upper border of the pons this is the lower border of the pons and from the basilar part of the pons on the side you have the middle cerebral cerebellar peduncle and at the junction of the pons and the middle cerebellar peduncle, you have the trigeminal nerve with its motor root medially and its sensory root laterally. And again, between this, uh, uh, between the pons and the medulla, you have the emergence of the abducent nerve between the lower border of the pons and the pyramid. And you have the emergence of the facial and vestibulocochlear nerves that is emerging between the lower border of the pons and the olive this rounded structure is the olive so you can see the facial nerve over here and the nervous intermedius a small uh, facial nerve is the motor part and the nervous intermedius is the sensory part the facial nerve you know is mostly motor so the motor nerve is the larger part the motor nerve is medial and the sensory nerve is the smaller part the smaller part is lateral the sensory nerve carries the taste fibers from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue not only that this nervous intermedius it is called intermedius because it is lying intermediate between the major part of the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve that is why this is called nervous intermedius now this intermedius we are saying it is the sensory part of the facial nerve but it is not just sensory it carries olfactory fibers and it also transmits the parasympathetic fibers from the superior salivatory nucleus so from the superior salivatory nucleus or some people say superior salivary nucleus and its detached part the lacrimatory nucleus you have parasympathetic fibers so nervous intermedius carries both the sensory fibers of taste and also the parasympathetic different fibers from the superior salivatory nucleus and the motor part of the fascia as you know is motor for the nerves of facial expression and the posterior belly of the digastric and the stylohyoid and the stapedius muscle and the auricularis posterior so a lot of muscles are being supplied by the motor root of the facial nerve so between the lower border of the pons and the pyramid you have the abducens nerve 
and between the lower border of the pons and the olive you have facial and vestibulocochlear nerve you can see in the trigeminal nerve the sensory root is large motor root is small in the facial nerve the motor root is large the sensory root is small and that is the important the difference now here in the vestibulocochlear nerve you have the vestibular and cochlear components of which the vestibular component is slightly medial the cochlear component is lateral again here in the brain stem in the medulla oblongata you can see the pyramid here the olive here and the inferior cerebellar peduncle on the side now in between the two pyramids here we have the anterior median sulcus and you can see the median sulcus is obliterated in the lower slender part of the medulla oblongata by the decussation or crossing of the fibers of the pyramidal tract and between the pyramid and the olive you can see the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve emerging this is these are the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve multiple rootlets and between the olive and the inferior cerebellar peduncle you have glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory nerves so you have the cranial part of the accessory and you have the spinal part of the accessory which is coming up from the upper five cervical spinal segments not only that over here you can see the lower surface of the cerebellum and you can see the flocculus of the floculo nodular lobe of the cerebellum and you can see the choroid plexus that is a tuft of capillaries and this choroid plexus is bulging out of the lateral aperture from the roof of the fourth ventricle now you know the has many exit points uh, in the midline it has it is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord so that is the direct line and again posteriorly you have a medial aperture and you have two lateral apertures the medial aperture is the foramen of lusca and the lateral apertures are the foramen of majendi and this is one of the lateral apertures and you can see the bulging of the tufts of capillaries coming out of the lateral apertures of the floor of the four of the roof of the fourth ventricle so now we have studied a huge number of structures part of the brain stem part of the lower surface of the cerebral hemispheres i just hope you have the time and energy to go through them time after time repeatedly so that you get them perfectly by heart thank you